like to thank everyone who makes this service possible. I believe we make Jesus happy and God proud that we serve him in the way we do. I can't not say something this morning regarding the sick world, the sorrowful world, the painful world that we live in at this time. We, this church, is very blessed. Jesus has his arms safely wrapped around each one of us. We can worship freely in this structure. And God bless the USA. Thankfully, God answers the mess of life with one word, grace. The bank gives us a grace period. The CD politician falls from grace. Music musicians hit that grace note. An actress is gracious. A dancer is graceful. Grace is used in naming a hospital, naming baby girls and kings. We all say grace before meals. The word grace has cousin words, forgiveness, faith, fellowship. Preachers preach it, hymns proclaim it, seminars teach it. Do we really understand it? Do we really believe in it? Who can say no? Have you been changed by grace? shaped by grace, emboldened by grace, softened by grace, grabbed by the back of your neck and shaken to, the, to your senses by grace. God's grace will soak you wet, turn you upside down. Grace is like a riptide. Grace comes after you. It rewires you. You go from insecure to God secure. From afraid to die to ready to fly. Grace is that voice that calls us to change and gives us the power to pull it off. When grace happens, we don't receive a nice compliment. God gives us a new heart. Give your heart to God, and he will return the favor. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you, Ezekiel 36, 26. You might call it a spiritual transplant. And when God hears your heart, he hears the beating heart of his son, Jesus. Paul said in Galatians 2:20. It is no longer I who live, but Christ in me. Yes, Jesus will move in when you let him. He still does that. When grace happens, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27. For many years, I missed this truth. I understood Christ in me. I understood Christ for me, Christ with me, Christ next to me, Christ holding me up, but I did not understand the Christ in me. I can't blame anybody but myself for this because Paul in the Bible refers to Christ in me 216 times, John 26 times. They describe the Christ that woos us to himself then wants us to himself. We become one. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. 1 John 4, 15. No other religion or philosophy makes this claim of 1 John. 
No other movement implies the living presence of the founder in his or her followers. The mystery is this, Christ in you, Colossians 1, 27. The Christian is a person in whom Christ is happening. We are Jesus Christ's possession, pos, pos, possession. We belong to him. We are even more increasingly him. He moves in and commands our hands, our feet, and restructures our minds and our tongues. He repurposes bad decisions and choices. Grace is God as heart surgeon, cracking open your chest, removing your heart, and replacing it with his own. Rather than telling you to change, he creates the change. Do you clean up so God can accept you? No. He accepts you and he begins cleaning you up. Jesus' dream isn't just to get you into heaven, but rather to get heaven into you. What a difference this can make. The gift giver giving gifts. We should also be forgiven people forgiving people. Grace is everything to Jesus. Grace lives because Jesus lives. Works because Jesus works. It matters because Jesus matters. To be saved by grace is to be saved by Jesus. This is not an idea. It's not a doctrine. It's not a creed. It's not a church membership. It's by Jesus himself only. He wants to get everyone into heaven that just gives him a simple nod. Not a response to a finger snap, a religious chant, or secret handshake, only through faith and prayer. Truth is, we don't get grace. Grace gets us. Grace gets a hold of us and hugs the stink right out of you. If you fear you've written too many checks on God's kindness account, drag around regrets, huff and puff, and get little rest, if you wonder if God can do something with the mess of life we're in, here's some good news. Watch grace happen. We will be confident when we stand before the Lord, even if our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. 1 John 3, 19 and 20. Have you ever said, Satan never shuts up? That accuser makes his career out of accusing. Satan brings no repentance, no resolve, just regret. He has one aim. Satan wants to steal, kill, destroy. John 10.10 10. Steal your peace, kill your dreams, destroy your future. Some so-called friends dredge up your bad past. Some people declare guilt, no grace. Let me tell you something. Jesus has acted on your behalf. Jesus is in the presence of God right now at this very moment. Sticking up for you and me, Romans 8, 34, let that just sink in for a second. Jesus in the presence of God, rising to your defense. Let us come near to God with a sincere heart and sure faith 
because we have been made free from a guilty conscience, Hebrews 10, 21. A clean conscience, a clean record, a clean heart, free from accusation, free from condemnation. Get this, not only from our past mistakes, but also for our future ones. Since Jesus will live forever, Jesus will always be there to remind God that he has paid in full for all our sins with his own blood, Hebrews 7.25. Let's turn together to Ephesians 2. Let's read Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loves us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavens, heavenly places with Christ Jesus, so that in all ages to come, he might show his surpassing riches in his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. We are, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. God's work in us. And Jesus raised us up with Christ, Jesus, and gave us a seat with him in heaven and did this for those of us in Christ so that for all future times, God could show the very great riches of his grace by being kind to us in Christ Jesus. I mean that you have been saved by grace by believing Ephesians 2. Farewell, earthly condemnation, stupid, unproductive, slow learner, fast talker, quitter, cheapskate, no longer. You are who Jesus says you are, spiritually alive, heavenly positioned, connected to God, a billboard of mercy, an honor child. This is the aggressive forgiveness we call grace, Romans 5, 22. Who can accuse the person that God has chosen? God is the one that makes them right. Who can say God's people are guilty? Jesus died and rose again and sits next to God and appeals for us. Romans 8.33. So why do we Christians still feel guilty? Not all guilt is bad. God uses guilt to awaken us to sin. We know guilt when it's God-given, it will bring alarm, longing, concern, Readiness to see justice done, 2 Corinthians 7, 11. God's guilt brings enough regret to change you. Satan's guilt brings enough regret to enslave you. Do you trust the advocate or the accuser? Let grace change you. Pay no attention to Satan's voice. You have an advocate with the Father and Jesus Christ, the righteous, 1 John 2, 1. And the advocate speaks on your behalf. There is therefore now 
no condemnation to those who are in Christ, Romans 8.1. Jesus never sinned. We, on the other hand, never stop sinning. We are dead in our trans transgressions and sin, Ephesians 2.1. We are lost, Luke 19.10. Blinded, 2 Corinthians 4.3. We have no hope in this world without God. We have nothing good to offer. Our finest deeds are rubbish, Philippians 3, 8. Hmm, that, sound, that song sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. What just happened? Grace happened. Christ took away our sins. He took them to a hill called Calvary. God is in God in his gracious kindness declares us not guilty. Romans 3:24. God gave us credit for Jesus' perfection. Here's some really good news for you. You can rest now. Your merits merit nothing. God's works merit everything. We race, we run. The government wants more taxes. The kids want more toys. The boss wants more hours. School needs more volunteers. Your spouse, more attention. The church wants us wants us to pray more, attend more, host more, read more. These are all good things, right? Every time we catch our breath, something else needs something else. But then God intervenes. I will bring you out of your burden. I will rescue you from your bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm with great judgment. It's not that we don't believe in grace. We believe it a lot. Jesus almost finished the work of salvation, but now he needs our help, right? So we give it to him. We accumulate good works. God grade, grades on the merit system, right? Good people move up and go to heaven, but how good is good? Do better. Do more, do it now, do good and you'll be okay, do more and you'll be saved, do right and you'll be all right. Most people embrace the assumption that God saves good people, so be good. Be moral, be honest, be decent, keep the Sabbath, keep your promise, pray five times a day, Say, stay sober and pay your taxes. What level of good is good enough? God has a much better plan. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourself it is a free gift of God. We find it easy to accept and trust the resurrection, but hard to believe the miracle of grace. Attempts at self-salvation guarantees nothing but exhaustion. Let's stop it once and for all. Your heart should be strengthened by God's grace, not by obeying rules, Hebrews 13, 9. Jesus does not say, come to me, all who are perfect and sinless, just the opposite. Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Let grace happen. You already have God's unending love and affection in your life. Okay, now that you know God's love for us, here's something you can do. Be kind to each other, tender-hearted, 
forgiving of each other, just like God, through Jesus, forgave you, Ephesians 4, 32. Jesus knew who he was, God's son. Jesus knew why he was here on earth, to serve his father. He knew his identity and authority. So what did the CEO of the universe, king of the world, creator of everything, do to show us his great power? He wrapped a towel around his waist, poured water into a basin, and started washing feet. Knowing that all authority was his, he exchanged his robe for a servant's wrap, got on his knees, and scrubbed the grime off of feet. Grace has happened to you and me. Look at your feet. To accept grace is to accept the vow to give it. Give the grace you have been given. Grace is not blind. It sees the hurt, but grace chooses to see God's forgiveness power even more. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble, Hebrews 12, 15. Remove your socks and shoes and let the hand of God wipe away all the dirtiness in your life. Forgiveness can happen with you. After all, we all have wet feet. I like what Matthew 23, 26 says. First, wash the inside of the cup and the outside will become clean. Don't fool yourself and say, I have no sin. That makes you a liar. But if we confess our sins, Jesus will forgive. He will cleanse us from all the wrongs we have done, 1 John 1. Confession is not telling God something he doesn't already know. Confession, confession isn't complaining, whining. Confession isn't blaming or pointing a finger. Confession is much, much more. Confession is a complete dependence on grace. Yes, what I did was bad, but grace is greater, so confess it. If our understanding of grace is small, our confessions will be small, reluctant, hesitant, with excuses, will be scared to death of our punishment. But God's grace understands. Create an honest confession. Let your prayer be, search me, O God, and know my heart. Include God in your self-assessment and pray for confident grace-filled prayers. God, be merciful to me, a sinner, because you are loving. Wash away my guilt and make me clean again. Jesus, you are right when you speak and fair when you judge, Psalms 51. Grace will happen. Talk to God, go to him, trust his ability to receive your confession the power of confession comes with the God who hears it. Trust God's grace. God's people are attracted to honesty. This church believes in confession. Here's a tip. Avoid the purple, perfect people you won't fit in. This church confesses their sins and shows humility where the price of admission is simply the admission of guilt. He will cleanse us from all the wrongs we have done, 1 John 1, 8. 
That is grace, my friends. Not cheap grace. It's not short grace or shallow grace. Jesus died so that Jesus died so all could receive his everlasting grace. This transformation is made by grace, and grace is the foundation of the Christian faith, life, and mission. With the certainty, he will cleanse you, not might, not could, not would, or has been known to, he will. God's grace is sufficient, sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Here's something you could read this afternoon, Romans 3, 23 and 24. Then thank God for grace. We thank you, Lord, for this special blessing that we have worshiping you on your day, Lord. Thank you for being our God and giving us a full measure of your grace. Be with us now as we go our separate ways. Go with us. Bring us back safely next week. Pray in your name, Lord. Amen.